We've had our eye on you for a while, Lloyd, Den Big said. You run with a crowd of red agitators at Anadel. Now you've brought this union organizer here. What do you think we ought to do to you? My knees gave out. Hands gripped me like iron pinchers and held me up. I tried to say, God, Johnson, I swear I didn't tell. One man threw open the furnace door. Shall we throw this white boy in and cook him? Their mouths opened. They were laughing. Who else took the pledge, son? Who else? A rifle butt struck me in the belly and I doubled over. They dragged me over to the furnace, made to lift me, and then pulled me back and threw me against the wall. I struck my head. I'd rather kill an organizer. It's more fun. I looked. Johnson's face was terrible. His eyes had turned to stone. They lifted him off the ground. He began to sing. It didn't really sound like singing. No more moaning, he screeched. No more moaning. He twisted his head so that the muscles in his neck stood out like ropes. His mouth curved in a smile. No more moaning over me. An orange sheet of flame belched from the furnace. Johnson's head fell back. I met his eyes. I knew he did not see me. That he was ripping his soul from his body and soaring away with it. And before I'll be a slave, they tossed him in the furnace and slammed the door. They raised me up. Go on home, Denbig said. You've got 24 hours to get out of Justice County or you're dead. Storming Heaven, written by Denise Giardina, the sequel to Unquiet Earth, takes place in the mountains of West Virginia in the early 1900s. It's a story that has been largely ignored in American history, like many other stories of the Appalachian region at this time. A tale both triumphant and tragic, it deals with the big business of land theft and exploitation of a local populace. By the early 1900s, it became clear to the coal companies that there were incredible fortunes to be made in the hills and mountains of West Virginia. These companies were avidly searching for inexpensive land that housed the natural resource that had grown so popular for travel and heating, a resource that is still widely used for many energy needs in this country today. Coal companies came into the counties and towns purchasing mineral rights from residents at rock bottom prices. Once it was determined that there was coal in the land, these residents would be forced to move. Mineral rights were superior to surface rights, and the land stripped, mined, and ruined. Those who would not sell were forced off their land by county sheriffs, paid off by the coal companies, and the same fate was applied to their once pristine mountain valleys and rolling hills. Many locals who either sold out or were pushed out ended up signing on to work in the mines. The idea that a steady paycheck would supersede the hardships of subsistence agriculture was soon dispelled by the horrendous working conditions that were present in these mines. With the routine gas pockets that killed dozens of men without making a sound, or a roof collapse, these men sacrificed their lives for a pittance of credit at the company store. The horrible working conditions and a below livable wage made this an excellent environment for liberal union leaders from the north to come down and organize. The problem was that the coal operators did not see a need for union organization and hired gun thugs to patrol the streets and homes searching for any sign of union activity. The main character, Rondell Lloyd, was the youngest son in a family that was forced off their land. The coal companies came in and bought the land from the county and simply evicted them. This land had been in their family for generations. Nephew of Dylan Lloyd, main character from The Unquiet Earth, Rondell stoked his hatred for the coal towns and their operators from a very young age. He grew up around the coal life and his father took him to work in the mines when he was just 10 years old. Rondell, through most of his teenage years and young adult life, surrounded himself with socialists men who believed that the coal operators were evil men focused only on the motives of profit and exploitation. These were the influences that drove him to become a union supporter, then organizer, then outlaw, then warrior. All in the name of workers' rights. Against great odds and threat of death, he managed to organize a union strike of three major coal mines in the county. The coal workers and their families were forced to live in tents and fought disease, starvation, and random gunfire by the thugs employed by the operators. 
It was a golden summer. We lived in tents, but the weather was warm and the Union sent us food. We had typhoid, but no more than was usual in the camps. Some of the mines still worked, but our men blew up coal tipples and burned company stores. Some were killed, but no more than in the mines. Jenkin Jones belonged to us, and whenever we walked to town, we were greeted with a sign proclaiming Free Anadel. The Free Press, black bordered in memory of C.J. Markham, ran articles extolling the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence. On every corner, an armed miner stood sentinel with his red bandana knotted around his neck. The gun thugs called us rednecks. It was a name we accepted with pride. The union support and numbers grew as the coal operators dug in their heels about working conditions and pay. This was echoed across the country as the Industrial Revolution was taking hold and many industries were facing union organization. Though West Virginia seemed geographically and politically isolated from the rest of the country during this time. In August of 1921, over 10,000 armed miners attempt to take a coal town on Blair Mountain. They were met by gunfire from a cadre of hired thugs and soldiers. This attempt was unsuccessful and many miners died at the foot of Blair Mountain. So what you gonna do, turn tail? I pushed him away and he toppled over backward. You're supposed to be so damn tough, I mocked. But you got your limit, don't you? I seen the gas, he pleaded. Jesus, I was in the army. You turn tail. It's them that turn, not me. They ain't no Americans. I snatched up my gun and ran from him, up the mountain. I dodged a stand of mountain laurel. Bullets picked chunks of bark from the oak beside me. Then a weight hit me in the belly and I fell. The mountain laurel caught at my arms, held them up. Legs came toward me like giant scissors. Bits of dead leaves stuck to the blood on my shirt. I was strung out tight, like a hog to be gutted, like a squirrel to be skinned. Rondell Lloyd's union organizing efforts increased national awareness of the West Virginia issue and propelled this incident into the popular press, although it was hailed and treated as a revolution and quelled. The Union eventually and peacefully came to many of the coal towns in West Virginia, and Rondell was paralyzed from the waist down for the few additional years that he lived. However, to this day, the coal companies still own the land. <laughs>